but you know, <laughs> lots of fun. I'd like to welcome you tonight to our class on depression. It's hard. Like, have you ever like studied depression? Okay, it's not the most uplifting thing to study. That's right. You know, like my gosh, you know. It took me back to the days, like for 20 years, I studied um, how to build a nuclear bomb, sh you know, shelter, and how to build decon chambers, and like I can save the world from anything. You know, oh my gosh, depressing. You know, it just got really awful. And I was like, okay, that's enough of that. I want to step out of that and lift, and lift it up a little bit. And that's kind of how I felt after preparing for tonight presentation, which I find we speak on depression extensively. We actually have a presentation called Forgiveness, How to Set Yourself Free, which really would be a great follow-up class. That's actually coming up in a couple weeks here, uh, actually next weekend on Saturday. Uh, it's a presentation that's free. So if you'd like to come, because emotions are chemicals, and when we talk about depression, we're looking at them, it's all chemicals. <laughs> it's everything is chemicals when it comes to depression, um, <clears throat> whether there be an imbalance too much. And so that class uh, takes you back to the third month in the womb. That's where emotions start. Uh, the third or fourth month, uh, month in the womb is when you start making actual emotions. And those are chemicals, polypeptides that are joined together. And this is fascinating to watch the development of emotions and then how we perceive emotions and how we need to learn to forgive. We might touch on one aspect of it later on if we get to it uh, in the presentation. But I really want to just throw a couple stats at you because that's what we're supposed to do when we do public speaking because it makes you excited and get you ready to commit, okay? Um, one thing we have been doing, especially a lot lately, is um, having people commit when we give presentations. We're just really big into commitment, whether it be for the Empowered classes, for our TNC classes, our cancer classes, and that is you've come here to learn something, you're going to learn a lot of information, as most of you who've heard me speak know that. Uh, but then I want you to commit to making some change because you're exactly in the state or your daughter or your husband or your son or whoever you're here for. We're in this state because of how we've lived our life. That's the biggest commit. So commit to change is the number one thing. Uh, otherwise, if you don't want to commit, just go back out, get your money back, okay, okay you know, just go home, <laughs> live all you're doing, okay? But committing is really, really important. So are we committed to making a couple changes with things that we might be learning? We have to be committed here. Excellent. So we're going to kind of throw some stats. There's 100 million people right now on um, antidepressants. That's It's one in four women are on an antidepressant. Okay, there's all these little sayings, you know, say, you know, about the candy that we live off of, right? Our, our womenhood here. We have th uh, $330 billion in sales annually. That's a third of a trillion. Okay, that's a really big number. <laughs> um, we have seven, and what's really kind of creepy, 70% of all the pharmaceuticals that are uh, related to, you know, in SSRI form are actually prescribed by untrained general practitioners. They're just medical doctors. Well, and that has a lot to do with the fact that we're only one of two countries in the entire world that have go see your doctor commercials on TV. They're direct sales. So it's a direct to consumer sale, a DDC, and we're the one of only two countries. New Zealand is the other one. And so all the rest of the world, they don't have it where the you know, pharmaceutical companies can actually put an ad out and they find for every thousand dollars they spend on a pharmaceutical ad that's on TV, a direct to consumer ad, they get 25 new patients that are, of course, recurring. Once you're on a drug, you're on a drug. Okay, until you come to a class, it carries energy. You're like, oh my gosh, I can do this. Oh, okay, anyway. So, um, so we have to look at that, that real stat. So we look at one in four women, on average, are on these medications right now. And we look at the thousand dollars, one thousand bucks that's spent on a drug being on, being advertised on the multimedia is able to pr procure that kind of um, following. It's a pretty serious thing. Uh, but seventy percent of those that are are prescribed are really from people who have had no training at all in psychology. They're prescribed because you go to your doctor and go, you know, I have symptoms of this Y and Z. And they're like, well, here, I got a drug for that. Unfortunately, there used to only be 44 different drugs. Now there's 174 different pharmaceuticals. And if you know a lot about pharmaceuticals or if you've heard me speak, they're a combination of drugs. And we'll talk about the liver. We'll talk about the P450 pathway in a little bit. There are now 374 different diseases that you can have given to you, okay? Oh, I hear it all the time. Oh no, I have blank, blank, blank. It's a very rare disease. I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know how many times I hear that in a week? Oh yeah, I'm sure it's really rare. It's only rare because not enough people you know, have been given that title yet to make it so rare. And it is it's just, it's all symptom. And when we look at any kind of disease or disease, we look at their, these are symptoms. People are, and they are having symptoms. They're severe uh, symptoms of, of depression, but a symptom is always caused by a cause. The red light in the car doesn't just start blinking one day unless it was triggered to blink by something. 
unless you have a really weird Honda once in a while. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> once in a while, I just blame like sort of to make sure you know it's there. I don't know. Okay. And three, this is probably the most staggering. 3,000 people a month are dying from taking prescription drugs and depression uh, as prescribed. That's very scary. There's a reason for that. A lot of it has to do with, with I know, with um, serotonin. And, and with the whole serotonin thing, I'm not a big pusher on serotonin's reason for depression. Just so you all know, there's enough science out there that shows there's no science behind proving that. Very little science is there that shows that serotonin is the big thing. We'll talk about serotonin, so you, because that's what SSRI stands for. Okay, so the serotonin retake, reuptake, okay, inhibitor. So, like, there's a, I want to explain that to you, so you know what SSRI does uh, at the, between, you know, the synapse and the neurons. But be aware that I'm not considering address serotonin. We'll touch on it for those who are like, no, I believe the serotonin. Okay, belief system works. I'll help you with some serotonin ideas. But there's actually a lot of things going on, uh, so I want to be sensitive to that. So when you look at a serotonin, you're looking uh, at a serotonin, it's something your body makes. Obviously, there's different things that help you make more serotonin. Serotonin regulates an incredible amount in the body, not just depression. It makes your appetite and your metabolism. It just it helps with everything. That's why thyroid is so important when it comes to depression. But anyhow, so you have your neurons and you've got a synapse. And this is how communication, uh, how communication is given to all the brain. It's like electrical wiring. That's why you're electrical uh, and what conducts electricity water, which is why water becomes one of the number one prescriptions for depression. Okay, make sure we got that clear. Two quarts of water by two. That's your right number one thing you write down. And so because water's conducting this electricity, then the, the serotonin can just pop over, ding, ding, and it can head right over to the next neuron, except sometimes that doesn't happen. So we'll get a whole bunch of them that come over, but then there'll be those that kind of get stuck. And when they get stuck, they can often be re retaken up in, back into the neuron. And all an SSRI does is make that not happen. So it makes it so they can't get uptaked so that they can at least be, you know, maybe retaken into the next neuron, et cetera, et cetera. That's all an SSRI is. The problem is that, does, that causes a lot of problems in the rest of the body because if they're blocking so many of the neurons from sharing impulses you're looking at, you're not just blocking this impulse, you're blocking really good impulses. You're blocking impulses to go feed the hungry, right? You're blocking impulses to um, stop eating. You're, 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 you're blocking thousands and thousands of impulses with the SSRIs, which is what leads to so many of the side effects. Does that kind of make sense? So we look at people who get on an SRS, SSRI drug, and I talk faster than my lips move sometimes. My brain's like, okay, go ahead, go, go next thing. Why? Oh, guys, you know. So when you're on the SSRI, what will happen is we have a lot of people that do have severe side effects. They do feel depressed. They do think suicidal thoughts. I mean, out of the 20 last um, shootings, the large mass shootings, every one of them was on an SSRI. Every single one of them because they weren't clearly getting signals. They weren't, they weren't making the signals, but they couldn't uptake the signal. So again, the SSRIs, why there's so many side effects and why there are 3,000 people dying a month is, and why there's so much money being spent every year on these medications is because this, they're not working properly. And that, So let's just move on because that's such a depressing thing to talk about. There's so many awesome things to talk about today. We're going to talk about positive things. Okay. And now we can really move forward on this. I do want to... Um, uh, use some of my notes because I do have 15 pages of notes, which I will not read to all of you today. Don't worry. I just, <clears throat> it's how I prepare, you know. So we're looking one in 10 Americans experience depression. And we all experience depression. Who hasn't experienced depression? Just got a phone call today. Someone's mission, while he's serving a mission, his wife, their mission president, just died. Like, just didn't wake up this morning. Oh, I'm sure there's some depression going on. That doesn't mean he's going to run and get a medication, right? There's going to be a loss. There's going to be something going on. Uh, whether it be that you wake up, like the day I woke up and my, my cat got hit by a, a truck. Oh, my gosh, right? I was like, I was 15, you know, it's my cat. <laughs> okay, but, um, you know, we don't pad that. We, we, we need to look at depression as normal. That's the number one thing is to look at that as, okay, this is a normal state. We'll talk quite a bit about depression, but just realize that we all are going to experience depression. Uh, and there's lots of names for it. Adjustment disorder, depressed mood, uh, dysmatic disorder, uh, which is a DSM. Uh, you're looking at chronic depressive disorder, major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders. And there's quite a few different names and terms that you'll hear. Uh, and what's unfortunate is when doctors, when a psychiatrist actually gives this label to someone, there is no testing done. There's no blood work. 
which if every emotion is a chemical, we can take blood out of people's bodies and tell you some of the emotions you're feeling because they're actual chemicals in the body. There's no testing done at all before they give you an, a, a label. That's probably the scariest thing in the world because you like you wouldn't just go on a cancer medication if you weren't treated, if you didn't know you had cancer in the body. Uh, you wouldn't be put on more insulin if you weren't aware that you needed to have more insulin in the body by doing blood work. Uh, or, of course, we wouldn't prescribe insulin. We'd just fix your pancreas. But anyhow, uh, so, but you need, you need testing. Testing helps you to see. Biomeridian testing can take you in and find, okay, what emotions are you experiencing that are making you have some of these depressed feelings? So, again, just be aware that there's no testing done. So, um, I would like to uh, quote, do a couple quotes here, and I'm going to throw some words at you that I, I don't know if you know or not, so if I, I'll, I could try to not throw them all at you, but anyhow, the, when ads started coming out in 1997 is when we started advertising in the United States to people, and when they first came out, I'm sure you all remember when we'd sit there at the TV and there'd be like, a half, you know, half a minute ad and a minute and a half of these are the things that can go wrong, right? Well, that was so boring to consumers that they went ahead and reenacted that law. The FDA went back and said, oh, you know, that's not all that important. Just put a couple of major side effects that could happen and just throw it on there. So they don't even give you the full side effects. Now it takes you about an hour and a half to read 0.5 text when you get a drug. <laughs> so I know it saves, it saves a lot of money on paying for advertising. Uh, anyhow, so that and that that's called adequate standard, by the way. And just some of the side effects from um, antidepressant medication, and I know that some of you in the room are on antidepressants. That's just how it is. If we're looking at one in four women, every time I speak, I know there's quite a few women in the audience, if not hundreds in the audience, that are on medication. So I'm sensitive to that. I want you to be aware of that, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit. And I want to make sure you kind of are aware of what's going on uh, at the cell level. And at the cell level, if you first before we talk about anything, let's make sure we review cells and cells functions. So every single cell in the body um, has a, its own respiratory system, so it breathes. It has its own reproductive system, so it reproduces itself and it makes an identical copy of itself uh, or stem cells, so it'll make a copy of itself. And so every one of our um, cells has a lymphatic system, so it's cleaning itself all the time, it's lysosomes, right? Every one of our cells has a mitochondria, that's the energy factory, ATP production. So our cells are very, very busy. The most exciting part of the cell, however, are those receptor sites. Bing! Okay, bing, bing, bing. We have receptor sites that are sticking up like little hairs all over those cell cells. And those receptor sites, every single one of them is like a lock and a key. There's a hole in the end of it or an indent. And when something floats around, it has to actually lock and key into that cell receptor site to trigger it to do something. So if this is an aquaporin receptor, doo -doo 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 -doo, it's looking for water. So along comes Gatorade. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, so along comes coffee. That's not going to work, but along comes water. It's going to bond and flush, and so the water will come into the cell, flush the cell, be used by lysosomes. It'll pick up debris and proteins that are not used anymore by the cell. Your cells are like amazing, like 3,000 enzymes in every one of them, and every single one of those 3,000 enzymes is loaded with proteins in it. So there's just all this matter inside every single one of your cells, and you got 70 trillion to 100 trillion cells. Lots of action, countless receptor sites. Well, cell receptor sites are everything when it comes to depression. As a matter of fact, cell receptors are everything when it comes to anything. That is how the body communicates with each other and how it grows. And so when we talk about cells and receptor sites, a couple of really important things for depression, as well as many diseases, is that cell receptor sites get clogged period. They can get inhibited. You can, you can have, you can drink out of a plastic water bottle. You can eat out of plastic bags or plastic containers or microwave something. You can have enzyme inhibitors. You can have inhibitors of cell receptor sites that'll block that cell receptor site. So in other words, if this is a cell receptor site, there's only two ways to make it uptake, to make it do something. Only two ways. A molecular frequency as eat the apple, eat the kale salad, I'm clear, right? No kill? Okay, okay. so eat that delicious. Eat the tomato, right? Eat the apple, whatever it was. And you eat that, and you're going to have thousands of constituents that go in and lock and key with all these cell receptor sites. So in your heart, if you have, you have a lot of cell receptor sites for magnesium, right? So et cetera, et cetera, through the body. So you have all these different receptor sites throughout the body. 
and each cell has a, a particular set of receptor sites to grow or to enact its duty. So, uh, you know, cells in the brain and in certain quadrants of the brain will have different receptor sites than the cells per se in your liver. So these receptor sites can be hit by a molecule that you eat or a pharmaceutical drug is a molecule or a frequency as in a word that is spoken, a tone that is used. That's why singing bowls and Tibetan bowls aren't just weirdo things that hippies do. Okay, they actually heal. Okay, and um, EMFs and you know your smart meter most dangerous thing in your house is the smart meter on the outside of your home. Uh, and actually, I was just meeting with a couple whose son um, is very suicidal. Wonderful kid, Eagle Scout, goes to church, loves the world, but he's suicidal. And I said, and as we had this long, this, this meeting with them, I was uh, working with their family in general. I um, immediately it hit me. I'm like, my gosh, where's the smart meter? It's on the outside of his bedroom, isn't it? And she's like, Don't do it. She's like, oh my gosh, it's on the side of his, where he's, his head is right here and the smart meter is right here. And I, smart the smart meter is how the electric company, the gas company know how much gas and electricity that you're using and they're all very related to depression so you look you look for that smart meter on the outside of the home uh, and there's other courses that we classes that we teach that relate to how to block that in my book there's a whole section on how to block emfs as well or and how to reduce that exposure Anyhow, uh, but those are very, those are, those are frequency. So molecule or frequency, that's the only two ways to make a cell receptor site do something. So tonight, because we're going to talk about depression, we're talking about SSRIs, we're talking about, all, we're going to talk about just an incredible amount of, of ways you can help get rid of depression in your home, in your family, in your own personal lives um, that will require one of two things, a molecular frequency or it'll require a frequency. And those frequencies also are emotions. Every emotion has a frequency. Every thought has a frequency, which you all know. You walk into a room and everybody's full of love and joy. You're like, oh, I just love it here. You know, you walk down an aisle at Walmart and you're like, everybody's angry and kicked off at their kids. Like, oh my God, I'm going to go home or go to the next aisle. You know, you're just, you kind of feel it wherever you go. Uh, you walk into a room and people have just been fighting. And you're like, oh yeah, not a good frequency, right? <laughs> Got to get out of here. And no one even said a word. So frequencies are everything and they hit your cell receptor sites. They trigger things in your body to happen. That is very important to understand. Uh, so anyhow, now we can move forward. So, uh, so the side effects. So here's how side effects work. I keep saying I'm going to use it. I never use it. I see for 15 pages of what? Anyhow, so a side effect. If you take a, I had epilepsy. So my whole life, you know, have a seizure, ring a bell, have a seizure, lay on the ground, uh, anyhow, and have a seizure. Entertaining. Anyhow, and so I, need, I wanted to get off my medication, but my medic and I did my medication. All three of them, by the way. Yay! Um, but my medications would 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 do this. Okay, it would prevent things from happening. It would make sure I didn't have a seizure. But then that frequency. That molecular frequency that went to the synapse of my brain to prevent a seizure also triggered X, Y, and Z to happen. I would get depressed more easily, right? I could gain weight more easily. My thyroid could get messed up, et cetera, et cetera, because it was also being picked up by my thyroid. It was getting picked up by my epistat, which is why I gained weight. It was picked up in my liver in numerous places, right? So all of a sudden, that frequency was picked up all over my body side side effects. Um, now here, the list of side effects from medications that are uh, prescribed for, for depression are just they range from everything from you know headaches to sleeplessness uh, feeling of being drugged you know the muscle weakness having swollen joints and different pains I'm not gonna read them all to you my feelings of nervousness of vomiting dizziness bowel problems instability inability to taste okay normally that is always a big one uh, excessive yawning the tight feeling in the throat and then the ser those are just easy side effects the serious ones are the visual or auditory hallucinations passing out blurry vision chest pain uh, unsteadiness when you walk a lot of people have um, a lot of ringing in the ears uh, change in urination uh, and urination uh, vaginal infections rashes hives itching etc and as a matter of fact in uh, 2007 I don't know how many you're familiar with this, uh, but 2007, the FDA even came out with like a black box warning saying that uh, the most serious type of side effect is the fact that it increases the risk of suicidal thoughts, tendencies, and behavior notably between the ages of 18 and 24. So just kind of understanding that that's one approach to depression. It is the major approach to depression is just to give them a drug. It's the major approach to ADD and ADHD right now. Now we, we've obviously learned in the last 10 years that there's much more natural approaches that work beautifully to get rid of depression uh, and keep it away as well as get children off of ADD and ADHD medication, uh, which we've profoundly had a great influence in. We've worked with school districts and helped them to, uh, in, uh, to bring in certain foods at 10 
nine o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon in classrooms and all of a sudden all their ADD, ADHD is gone. Well, that's just not, that's not luck. Okay, it's understanding cell receptor sites, understanding what, what omega-3s can do to the body, right, DHA. It's understanding what foods can help uh, the body so that you aren't triggering this, um, this convulsion, this impulse. Okay, dokie. Okay. Uh, to understand, I love this, to understand what an imbalance is, we must know what a balance is. And still to this date, there's not a single psychiatrist, no science, by the way, there's no science behind psychiatry at all. Um, there's not like no science. And that's one of the coolest things is because I love biology. I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of cell biology. Uh, biology, like psychology is dependent on biology. Well, biology has advanced tremendously in the last 40 years, 50 years. Psychology hasn't done anything. They've still, still, they're still prescribing the same drugs they've been doing for 60 years. They have not bit at all, even though biology has proven so much different about the actual cell matrix. So just note on that, that, that you, it's not progressing. It's not going anywhere. Um, and there's all these crazy studies you can read that'll just depress you more. But anyhow, uh, back in 1940, all the top psychiatrists met together and they're like, they actually made a plan because, and their plan, and it's stated in the, and in the books you can read them, uh, their plan was to create enough chemicals that they could then control the emotions of most humans on earth. Like that was their objective by 2000. Well, well, that happened, didn't it? And now we're at 174 different medications that control the emotions of people. Uh, and that's just, this wasn't like just a fluke that all of a sudden like, people got depressed and on medications. There's, there's always, there's always evil, but there's always greatness. And I don't even call it evil. I call it darkness, you know, and light. There's, there's, so, there's always some of that darkness, but there's lots of light. Unless we all start going some dark road and then I'm gonna leave because I'm not going there with you. <laughs> I love the light, man. I'm kind of drawn to it. We've got lots of lights. Okay, here you have a lot of lights, don't you? No, we're all lit up today. That's right. That's right. Uh, kind of an interesting analogy uh, on using any kind of medication, especially for depression. That's what we're focusing on tonight. Is if you had a woman who was depressed, you're like, okay, take two glasses of wine every single day. That will help with the depression. Okay, so she starts drinking two glasses of wine every single day. Well, after six months. What kind of what kind of problems let me see? <laughs> we might be seeing some problems. Okay, well she's drinking the two glasses of red wine every single night, and she's not feeling as sad. But now she has all these other metabolic problems. Now after ten years of drinking two wines every single evening, would we have problems? Yes, we'd have problems because the rest of the cells in the body aren't used to that, and those cell receptor sites become clogged. They become suppressed not only by foods and toxins that we eat. Uh, well, that's the main thing, of course, uh, but then by you know the chemicals that we use and our foods as well. So we'll, we will get to some of that. The, um, okay. So, uh, I'm just going to throw some studies at you here to show you that there's a lot of proof. There's actually more proof that antidepressants don't work than they do work because there isn't a lot of science behind that. They demonstrated that from 1987 to 2004, 12 antidepressants were approved on only 74 studies. 38 of the 74 studies were positive. 37 of those were published, 36 were negative, showing that there's no benefit at all to SSRIs, and three of those were published. So they published 37, looking, look at this, this is incredible. They published three of the 36 that said, no, they weren't so good. And then the positive, and then the ones that had positive, only 22 were unpublished. So it's very uh, skeptical there. We're looking at mm, pseudoscience. Uh, and there are 3,000 patients who were treated with antidepressants, um, psychotherapy, placebo, or no treatment. During the whole 3,000 people being, uh, being treated, they found that only 27% of the therapeutic response was attributed to the drug's reaction. 27% out of 100% actually had thank you to the drug. So a lot of, and there's a lot of studies on placebos where um, people were given, you know, they were given Prozac or given a specific antidepressant drug and they were just, you know, feeling great, feeling great. And they were switched to a sugar pill uh, and I'm told that they were switched to a sugar pill and they're like, oh man, I don't feel it anymore. But they actually kept on Prozac. I mean, so placebo had so much, I, the whole, I should do a whole thing on placebo one day because you'd all just love, wouldn't that be a fun class? The placebo effect, you know, it's absolutely amazing. I love that. Can do and yeah so they actually had lost their sensitivity to Prozac even though they were still on it they just thought it wasn't working more because they were told they had a sugar pill instead so again placebo is always a big thing anyhow um yeah another study an unimpressive rate of 18 percent you know um finding remission after a year uh, of using the drug so the the 5 HT receptor is actually that serotonin receptor um on the, on the cells of the body and those are some the, on the serotonin is found in the central and uh peripheral nervous system and 
and that is what regulates neurotransmitters, uh, including glutamate, uh, GABA, dopamine, um, etc. The or hormones, and oxycontin, cortisol, etc. Et your appetite. I think most of you know that aggression, anxiety. And, you know, in general, several findings support the fact that depression may not be caused solely by an abnormality of this 5-HT hormone of the receptor site, serotonin. Uh, there was no hormone, sorry about that, but the 5-HT function, but more likely by a dysfunction of other symptoms or brain regions modulated by the same 5-HT, which means they're showing that ooh, depression might not only be because of the serotonin, there's actually a lot of other things going on right now that it could be attributed to. So there are actually two really great websites I wanted to share with you if you're on a medication and you would like to get off of a medication. Um, because legally, I can't tell you to do that. If you're a member, I can have a consult with you and I can help you a little bit, but uh, legally, there's no way I'm going to step into that one. Uh, there are two great ones. Called, one's called survivingantidepressants.org. Wonderful resource. Um, hundreds of posted articles and uh, chat, you know, chat boards and people you can communicate with there. So survivingantidepressants.org and beyondmeds.com. Those two websites are going to be very helpful for people who are looking to get off medication. We have worked with a lot of people who have gotten successfully off their medication. Uh, it's, been, it's been a miracle. It's been wonderful to watch them. And I can gladly tell you every single one of them is doing incredible. Um, so the SSRIs, the antidepressants, um, and other forms of medication that people are given for uh, the instability um, is something that we've, we've seen great success with. Did you have a question at all? No, no. sorry. No, don't be sorry. That's okay. You glad it's right. Don't mind about. Okay. Um, okay, we, I really want to, we, I can focus on quite a bit of the negative stuff or more stats, which I can continue to do, but I really want to get in quite a bit into what you can do at home uh, to prevent depression, to uh, be able to help reverse some of the depression that's going on in someone's life. Uh, as they, and what we've seen best with the clients that we've worked with is that we find we give them X, Y, and Z that they can start doing. And so as they get off their antidepressants, it makes it much easier. And just be very aware that this can take several months. It can take a year to get the medication literally or more out of your body, especially if you've been on antidepressants for a long time. Uh, we worked with someone who was on antidepressants for most of their life. I mean, they actually prescribe antidepressants to two-year-olds now. They've done studies on antidepressants in young little children. Uh, it's very scary. There's My son was three when they diagnosed him with depression. Oh, isn't that just, just, yeah, it's just so wrong. Uh, and it's, <laughs> we're going to move from there. Um, by the way, Harvard researchers, people always get excited when I mention their Harvard research study. So I thought I'd throw one in here. Anyway, long-term antidepressant use may be um, actually reversed. It is, it, it is possible that antidepressant agents modify the hardwiring of the, the synapses, uh, not only render antidepressants ineffective, but also include a resistance. Uh, so they are, there's a lot of, um, a lot of proof out there showing that that these can be very dangerous and yet uh, people are able to get off of them and live very well. So what will happen also is because you're on that medication for so long, it literally does uh, modify how the rest, as Harvard uh, researchers have pointed out as well, it modifies other parts of the body. So when you're on an antidepressant and your face starts to drop or you start to gain weight or you start to have, of course, lib no libido anymore, big side effect, then you actually do look worse. And so when you go off of medication, you not only have to rebuild what's going up here in the synapse, right, but you need to actually rebuild build the rest of the body. You need to help the body start to reform again. And that's a lot of cell work. That's a lot of cellular regeneration. That means a lot of sleep. <laughs> that's when your body does the work is when you're sleeping. So when the sun starts to set and that frequency hits the earth and your pineal gland makes you yawn, you just listen, you obey. Okay, I'm going to bed. The sun went down, I'm going to bed. That's why we have it. The pineal gland makes melatonin. Melatonin puts you to sleep so you can lay still so your body can repair. And one of the most important things to do when you're healing from uh, depression is to sleep. Uh, very, very soundly. And if you can get to sleep, you know, eight or nine o'clock in the evening, 10 o'clock latest and wake up when the sun comes up or wake up at that six o'clock, we actually don't, uh, we had, we, for my, most of my life, uh, my married life, at least I didn't have curtains in my bedroom. So I woke up when the sun came up and when our, our rooster would curl. But anyhow, so I have, now I have a rooster in my backyard. We're in a city for Pete's sake. And there's a rooster that still wakes me up every day. He's my friend. I can't talk to him, but you know, through the window. But anyhow. <laughs> so our bodies do really well with early light, by the way, waking up to early light. That's what sent it sets the um, circadian rhythm in the body. So being able to go outside, even just to wake up and open the door and look around the sun, kind of do the sun circle, uh, get outside, blink your eyes in front of the sun, do a thyroid tap. There's a lot, you, there's a lot to this 
waking up with the frequency of the sun. Uh, so we highly would recommend that you go to bed earlier, wake up earlier in the morning. So when that early sun is in the sky, you're able to actually, you know, um, become more balanced with it. And you will feel a difference. You can't do these things and not feel better. It's a very, very wonderful frequency thing. Okay, dokie. So... Uh, well, we know that. We've we've seen numerous doctors come out with reports that within just one to two weeks of people being on antidepressants that they have suicidal thoughts. It's a very immediate thing that a lot of people do experience. Um, okay, so now we'll get to all the fun stuff. So take control. So because your liver is the chemical factory of the body. So your liver is on the right side of the, of the body from your hip up to the middle of your breast and over. So this entire thing is your liver. On the left side, you have your heart and you've got your stomach and you've got your spleen and you've got your pancreas, right? So the left side is the busy factory of breaking things down to get things to the liver, okay? So you have to do all this, you eat some food uh, and it comes down your, you know, breaks down with amylase, comes down, down your esophagus, ends up in your stomach. That stomach churns the hydrochloric acid, which is important. You need to have two to 4% acid in the stomach. And then as it's breaking down with, pro with, pro with pepsin, pepsin breaks down proteins, so very important, that comes in the duodenum, goes through your 23 feet, and then is sucked up in by the capillaries to take into your liver. So everything you eat or drink or breathe is then taken to the liver, but because the liver is the chemical factory of the entire body, uh, there's over 571 things that the liver does. One of them is it makes bile, it stores it in your gallbladder. That's why we keep our gallbladders, because they're storage tanks for bile. And we need bile whenever we have an avocado or olive oil or a french fry or a chip. We need, uh, we need, uh, we need olive oil. We need bile to help break that down. And yeah, but this liver has many functions. Uh, it's in the liver that when you eat a red pepper, it turns into calcium. Uh, so it's in the liver that you have a P450 pathway. Um, and that P450 pathway, that's the slang term, but the P450 pathway is what literally, it's like a conveyor belt. And it can process one chemical at a time. So if we eat something that has 30 chemicals in it, which is most of your right your chocolate bars, right? You're gonna your process ones. You have a lot of chemicals going through that the liver has to go ahead and digest. You eat something from a fast food joint and you're loaded with different chemicals that the liver has to process. We take a pharmaceutical or two or three every day and we have a lot of chemicals that the liver has to process. Why people gain a lot of weight when they start taking anything from birth control to antidepressant medication is because the liver can only process one thing at a time. That's the P450 pathway. And so if you have a whole bunch coming in and your P450 pathway can't process it all, it just goes ahead and sticks it in some fat for some storage. They're called storage lockers, right? It's what fat, all fat is, a storage locker for chemicals that can't be processed yet by the body, can't be used. Too many calories coming in the body, so they get stored because they have to get processed. It's just all the whole body's processing. And so when we take medications, it can do multiple things. Obviously, you can have numerous side effects of medication. It can turn the apostat off. The apostat controls your appetite, so you just keep eating. Uh, it can get stored in fat, and so you actually gain weight when you go on these medications. And so that P450 pathway where the chemicals come to is going to be very important to keep clean. So, of course, one of the first things we ever recommend is cleaning the liver. Uh, but however, don't jump on the liver cleanse unless you're having two or three bowel movements a day because it's not going to do any good. So you have to have bowel movements. Uh, when the bowels are clean and your colon is only five feet, your small intestine comes through here, your right hip over, this is your ileocecal valve and your colon ascends, transverses, and descends. So it literally is only five feet and right underneath that rib cage is that transverse colon. And so if you're ever like, oh, I got a stomach ache. Well, your stomach's over here. That's not a stomach ache. You're constipated or you can't digest something properly. That's, only, that's the only thing that happens here is digestion, leaky gut, not enough enzymes, or constipation. That's it. That's the answer always. Um, and so, well, you can have cysts or cancer growth, but you won't have that when this is clean. Uh, and so making sure that that body regulates and has bowel movements. So once we make sure we're having some bowel movements every day and antidepressants can cause you to be constipated. So you need to eat a little bit more fiber, drink some water, make sure you get some good herbs in there. That, that part's all in the book. Um, and then you can start moving those bowels. Then we go in and we do a nice liver cleanse. So you can do a liver cleanse of your choice to help cleanse the liver and reestablish some health in the liver. And then there's other things you can just do naturally. And we're going to kind of go through quite a bit of those. Um, and so this intestinal system is so important. That's why we focus on it. 90% um, of your serotonin is made in your intestinal system, if you aren't aware of that. So if you are a serotonin believer on all of this, okay, serotonin is really important, by the way, but you're going to have a lot higher serotonin level and be a, a bit more happy 
happy if you were having regular bowel movements and this is kept really clean. You have flora, five pounds of gut bacteria at all times in your intestinal system. You need five pounds of gut bacterial uh, gut bacteria in there. And you go ahead and drink a glass of chlorinated water from your from your city and boop, you just killed it all. So that's start over again. Okay, we antibacterial soaps. Yeah, don't ever use those. Antibacterial soaps will never kill a virus in the first place. And bacteria aren't so hard to get rid of when you understand the bacteria. Um, some can be hard, but most aren't. And so when you're using antibacterial soap, where is it going? It's going into your bloodstream and it's circulating and it's killing the gut bacteria in your intestine. Very important. You're saying you have a lot more good bacteria than you do bad in the body. So building this intestinal system up with raw sauerkrauts, kefir, coconut kefir, um, the kombucha, those are really important things. Taking a good probiotic, whatever way you want to bring in your culture, but making sure you have cultures that are coming into the body that will help the intestinal system stay really healthy because this is where so much of your immunity lives as well as the serotonin is made. So making sure that stays um, nice and clean.